And guys, here are the in-class notes for the 7.2 lesson. The warm-up, I'm going to go kind of fast, so make sure you pause, take breaks when you need them. We have the length of the rectangle is 16 inches, and the width is 10 inches. We want to know the ratio of the length to the width. So the first thing we need to make sure that we're focusing on is what do they want the ratio of, because they may switch it around. Here they gave us the length, then they gave us the width, which is the order they wanted in, but sometimes they will switch it, so be careful with that. So here we are going to take the length to the width. So when we take a look at this, the length we're being told is 16, so we'll have 16 over our width was 10 inches. We take a look at this and we need to see that we can simplify this, so we want to simplify and reduce. Both of these can be divided by 2, giving us final ratio of 8 to 5. Next, number two is exactly like the number two on the 7.1 lesson, as well as we went over one using complementary angles. What we're looking at here is we have three angles that are going, uh, three angles of a triangle. Remembering that they add up to 180 degrees. The 7, 9, and 20 are these three angle measurements simplified down. So we need to go back to our original angle measurements. Like up here, just like how we had 16 over 10, we divided by the same number 2 to simplify our ratio. Now we're going the opposite direction. The 7, 9, and 20 are the angle measurements simplified. So going the opposite direction, we need to do the opposite and multiply by a number. So when we take this 7, 9, and 20, we need to multiply it by an unknown number, which in math we use x. So if we have that 7, we do 7 times that unknown number. We would also take the 9 and multiply it by that same unknown number, that scale factor that we talked about in um, the lesson, in, uh, lesson as well. And then that 20, these are, again, our simplified ratio. We're going to take all of these, and if once we multiply by that scale factor, we add them all together, they should equal that 180 degrees. This is where this, this is why we have this equation with all the exits. Okay, recap all my markers. We'll go ahead and solve for x. We're going to combine our like terms, adding 7x, 9x, and 20x. We're going to get 36x, all equal to 180. Then we need to divide both sides by 36 x will equal 5. This is our scale factor. This is the number that we are going to be multiplying our simplified ratio by to get our original angle measurements. They do want each one. So we're going to take our 7, multiply it by our scale factor of 5, and find out that our smallest angle measurement was 35 degrees. Then we're going to take our 9, we're going to multiply it by the scale factor of 5, and our middle angle, middle sized angle, was 45 degrees. Lastly, we take our largest angle, that 20, the biggest number. We're going to multiply that one exactly by the same thing, 5, and we're going to get 100 degrees. That will be our largest angle. We double check ourselves and add these together to make sure they do equal 180 degrees. When we get down to number two, we talked about in the video about what similar polygons are, similar figures are, the, the notation, and how our corresponding parts, we still find them the exact same way as when we had congruent angles, uh, or sorry, congruent figures. It's just now our sides are no longer congruent. Our sides will be proportional, uh, the sides that correspond. So here we still go with, okay, F was our first, we're looking at angle F right here will correspond with the first letter over here, angle J. So we don't want to look at F and L. We need to look at the name. So angle F will correspond and therefore be congruent to angle J. Then we have angle G right here will correspond with angle K. So these two will be congruent. And then lastly, we have angle H will correspond with angle L, making those congruent. Same thing with the sides. We're going to take our first two letters, segment FG, so our first two letters, with our first two letters, will be segment JK. Next, we have our last two letters, 
segment GH with our last two letters, segment KL. And then our outer two letters, FH, in that order, JL, segment JL. Then we move over to the fractions. As we're taking our ratios here and we're turning them into our fractions, bringing them into um, our actual values, our numeric values. And this is how whenever we have two of them set up equal, that's where we get into our proportions. So all we're doing is we're transferring these segments over here and dropping the segment bars off. So FG is to JK, GH is to KL, as we see right here, and lastly, FH is to JL. On the next page, uh, we found out, I am going to put this here for a reason, we found out that our scale factor from uh, to create quadrilateral EFGH was 4, right? We should already have that on our notes. I'm um, putting that because uh, we're going to use it. We also found out that X equaled 4, so we want to make sure we put that there um, so we can find uh, EF and G later. Now, I ask you to find Y and Z. I'm actually going to walk through finding Z first because I'm going to show you something else, another way that sometimes uh, if you have a scale factor, you can find your other sides, your missing sides. So first, let's look at Z. So I'm going to set up my proportion, a little proportional setup. Now with X, we had to use the 2.5 and 10 because those are the only two corresponding sides that both had numbers. If you look up here, we now have a 4 and a 16. We can use the 2.5 and 10 if we want, by all means. Or we can use the 4 and the 16. I'm going to use the 4 and 16 for a couple of reasons. One, no decimal. Okay? So I have 4 to 16 is equal to, well, we're looking for Z. So 4 to 16, Z is equal to Z to 5. The other reason I wanted to use the 4 over 16 is to show you that simplification. You can simplify 4 over 16 so you're dealing with smaller numbers. Uh, 4 and 16 can both be divided by 4, giving you 1 over 4. So now when we cross multiply, instead of 16, we're going to do our cross product of 4 times Z, giving us 4Z is equal to the cross product of 1 and 5, a 5. We divide both sides by that 4. Obviously, we're going to get a decimal. 4 cannot go into 5 evenly. This will come out to 1.25. So I'm going to go up here and make sure that I label that. Okay. Now, why? There is another way we can find why since I have my scale factor. Y is on my bigger, my bigger quadrilateral over here. So we discussed down here on B that the scale factor from ABCD to EFGH is 4. Scale factor, a multiplier. So all we have to really do is take these sides, multiply them by 4, and we get all four of these sides. For example, 4 times my scale factor of 4 is 16. And if you plug into the calculator, 2.5 times my scale factor of 4, you're going to get 10. If you take 1.25 and multiply it by the scale factor of 4, you will get 5. So what we can do here uh, is we can multiply the side by the scale factor. So we take our side length, we find our corresponding y corresponds with 3, so we take that side length of 3 times our scale factor of 4 and this will equal 12. So y is going to equal 12. Okay. Now when I go through the perimeters, I'm not going to use separate colors. I'm just going to go straight into this, grab a pen, and your perimeter, we need to remember, is going to be adding up all four sides. So when I add up all four sides of triangle ABC, I'm sorry, quadrilateral ABCD, I'm going to be adding 1.25 plus 3 plus 2.5 plus that 4. When I add these all together, I will get a decimal. I'm going to wind up with 10.75. Okay. Now the next one, um, the shape's going to be off the screen, but I'm just going to grab all the numbers from here and add them up for F to find the perimeter of EF, quadrilateral EFGH. Those sides were 5 plus 12 plus 10 plus 16. When we add these up, they give me 43. 
In the original video, the ratio, I told you I wanted the ratio of the perimeter of ABCD to the, to the perimeter of EFGH. So all that means is take these numbers. ABCD goes on top, so we have the 10.75, and then the EFGH, the 43, is going to go on bottom. This will simplify out, in fact. Uh, it might not be easy to see, but we also don't like decimals in our fractions. So when we divide the top by the bottom, we may get a decimal, but we should be getting 25 hundredths, 0.25, which when we convert that back to a fraction, this simplifies down to one-fourth, and that will be the ratio. In the video, we talked about your ratio of your perimeter is going, I'm sorry, this, your, yeah, your ratio. So um, the last thing I do want to do on this video does not have anything to do with this packet, but it deals with the 7.2 practice. So a couple things I want to clarify because I had some great questions come up in class. Um, you're going to have problems on the 7.2 practice that ask you about the included angle and the included side. So I want to make sure we're clear on this because uh, it's worded a little different than we're used to. If I have this quadrilateral here and I have a problem, I say, hey, I want to know the side that is included with angle M and angle N. Well, what we're looking at is angle M is right here and angle N is right here. So I want the side that's included with those two. And included means between them. So how would I name that side? Well, I would either name it segment MN or segment NM either one. And if you notice, all I did was take the two angles, put them together with the segment bar above it. Okay? Sometimes it works out that easily. Sometimes you have to draw it and look at it. The other one would be, let's say that I wanted to know the angle included with segment PQ and segment MP. So we take a look at where those are. We have segment PQ right here, and we have segment MP right here. Well, what angle do these two meet at? What angle do these two segments create? Right here, angle P. Also, great thing is, what letter do both of these share in common? Angle P.